friends and welcome back. I'm Mark Baker and in today's broadcast we're going to continue talking about our discussion looking at walking in the miraculous. Did you know that God desires to use you much more than you desire to be used by him? The problem though is we are pursuing the manifestations of his power more than we pursue him. We are pursuing basically what he does in not pursuing relationship. If you will take the time to develop a relationship, and it does take time, it takes a commitment, it takes effort, just as any relationship does. You know, a husband and wife are not going to have longevity in their relationship if both are not willing to invest in the relationship. And God has already proven his commitment to relationship with you by sending Jesus to the cross. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus on the cross as his commitment to relationship with you. And the only thing he asks in return is for your time. Unfortunately, for the majority, he's asking too much. But what about for you, friend? Is he asking too much? Are you willing to commit time to spending with him? Are you willing to devote your time? Are you willing to turn off the TV? Are you willing to miss your favorite game or your favorite sitcom or, you know, skip the news broadcast tonight to spend time with him? Because it's all about relationship. And you'll find that as you pursue relationship, the power will follow. Our anchor scripture is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But before we get started today, let's take a pause and ask the Holy Spirit for his help. Holy Spirit, my dear friend, I thank you for your presence. I yield to your teaching ministry today. I ask you to use my tongue as the pen of a ready writer to speak to those who watch this broadcast. And I pray for them and ask you to, to just speak to them, guide them, lead them, reveal Jesus to them. In God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, we lift up our eyes to you, and we ask you to give each person watching this broadcast the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your commitment to this relationship, and we thank you that you that your Holy Spirit is with us to help us each step. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, friend, if you don't have your Bible, go ahead and grab it, and let's go dig in and see what the Holy Spirit has for us today. We're going to begin... In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is our anchor scripture, then we're going to jump back to Matthew chapter 14, where we ended in the last broadcast. And I know we kind of ended abruptly. I introduced the account of Jesus feeding the multitude. We're going to pick up there. We're going to start looking at some things with this and seeing what the Holy Spirit has for us and what He can, you know, what we can learn about walking in the miraculous. But before we do, I want to remind you that we also looked at the first miracle Jesus did in the last broadcast. In John chapter 2, we see the story of Jesus attending a wedding with his disciples. His mother Mary was there. They ran out of wine, and his mother's instructions to the servants were one of the keys that we're talking about in walking in the miraculous. Whatsoever he says, do it. But if you do not know what he says, how can you do it? Faith is based and grounded in the word of God. If you do not know the word, if you do not have an understanding of the word, you cannot have a grounding in the word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So we are talking about the power in the word. Because you cannot get to the miraculous without the word. We've seen in the previous broadcast that God, that Jesus works with us while we preach the word, and he confirms his word with signs following. I said that a question we should be asking ourselves as ministers is if we are not seeing the miraculous following our preaching, then what are we preaching? And I'm talking to myself here too, friend. I'm not just talking to you. Because he confirms his word with signs following. If we are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as Paul preached, as the disciples preached, we should be seeing the same manifestations. We should be seeing the same miraculous results. 
So if we are not, then we should be asking ourselves some hard questions. We should be examining what we're preaching. We should be looking at it, questioning, are we preaching the correct message? Are we preaching theology? Are we preaching doctrine? Or are we preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Too often people preach tradition, doctrine, theology, because for many ministers, it's about job security more than eternal security. They are willing to compromise their message to avoid the risk of losing their job. But I tell you, as we get closer and closer to Jesus' return, things are going to become much more interesting for those who are willing to stand up for the truth. We're already seeing this. We've read, I've, I've heard reports. I live in the United States. I've heard reports just in the past year of ministers being arrested for standing up in the truth. We're getting up to that time where standing up for the truth is becoming more and more of risk to being accepted by society. But do you want to be accepted in heaven or accepted on earth? Romans chapter 8 tells us to be carnally minded as death, but to be spiritually minded as life and peace. We should not worry about the consequences of the message we preach. We should worry about preaching the message the Holy Spirit imparts to us. That message will come from the Word. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would reveal Jesus to us. There is a lot we need to be thinking about because it all comes back to the message because the message is the power. We don't pursue the miraculous. We don't pursue the signs and wonders. We pursue the word and the miraculous will follow because he confirms his word with signs following. But we've got it all mixed up. We spend hour after hour in prayer meetings praying for him to pour out his miraculous power when we should be praying for a deeper revelation of the word, for an understanding of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul preached, that Peter preached, that the disciples preached. Let's go back over here to the feeding of the 5,000 and pick this up again. I just kind of introduced it in the last program, just kind of left you, you know, at a cliff point. But let's go back and look at this and see some things that we can learn from this. Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. Again, looking at this in context, Jesus had heard that his cousin John had been beheaded by Herod. He had heard about his cousin's death, just like you and I. He was living in a human body. He was a man anointed by the Spirit. He was the Son of God, but he was living as a man. He grieved just as you and I would grieve. He departed from the crowds to get away, to spend time alone, to process what would happen, what had happened. The people followed him, and we'll see that he took a boat crossed the lake to, to a desert place to get alone. And when he came off the boat, he found a crowd waiting for him where he expected to find solitude and silence. But he had compassion on them. And we pick this up in verse 14. Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. There's an interesting thing here, because Jesus got out of the boat, he saw them, and he was moved with compassion, and he healed their sick. But the interesting thing here is he didn't just heal the sick. Matthew only records the fact that he healed their sick. But look over here in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 and verse 29. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed unto a desert place by ship privately. Now the interesting thing is, if we back up, once again you see that Herod had beheaded John. So Jesus heard about that. But the disciples also were returning from ministering from a trip that they'd been sent by Jesus to minister. And they talked about the things that had happened. But they were tired. Jesus saw many people coming and going. And so not just for himself, but also for the disciples, he instructed them to depart to a desert place. He goes on to say, they departed 
into a desert place by ship privately. The people saw them departing, and many knew him and ran afoot there, there, out of all the cities, and out went them and came together unto him. So they saw where he's going. It says they knew him. The people understood him. They understood his habits. They understood what Jesus did. He followed patterns just like you and I do. The word got out that Jesus was departing to his private place. People left the cities went to the desert. When the ship got to where Jesus expected to find a resting place for him and the disciple, he found the crowd waiting for him. People pursued the power in his ministry. And if you look in John chapter 2, and we'll, we'll probably look at it in the series, but it says that he, you know, the people came to him, they received from him, they were attracted to the miraculous but he didn't attach himself to them. Why? Because he knew their heart. Were these people actually coming because they wanted to be around Jesus? They were interested in him. Or were they coming to pursue the power? Now, over Matthew, we saw that he healed their sick. I want you to notice something that Mark adds here. When we get into this and look at this. It says, Jesus, when he came out, saw much people, was moved with compassion toward them because they were as a sheep not having shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Mark doesn't talk about the healings, but he does talk about the teaching. Go back over to our anchor scripture and think about it. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolish, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So we see in Mark that Jesus taught, and in Matthew we see he healed. He taught and then he healed. When you look at Jesus' ministry, you will find that Jesus taught, he preached, and he healed. When you teach, you explain. When you preach, you proclaim. When you heal, you demonstrate. What are you demonstrating? You are demonstrating what has been taught and what has been preached, what has been explained and what has been proclaimed. You demonstrate. You cannot demonstrate what has not been explained. You cannot demonstrate what has not been proclaimed. The healing follows the message because the message is the power. The healing and the miracles confirm the message preached. Absent the word, you will not have the miraculous manifestations we see in the book of Acts and in the gospel account of Jesus' ministry. Because God works with his word. We saw this in Mark chapter 16. And I keep quoting it. But we did look at it in the previous broadcast. But in verse 20, Mark 16, 20, it says, They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. He confirmed the word that they preached with signs following. So doesn't it make sense when Mark talks about the fact that Jesus taught and Matthew talks about the fact that he healed, in context of all scripture, that the healing was a confirmation of the message that Jesus taught. When you teach, you explain. Discipleship requires explanation. Preachers proclaim. They do not go into depth. They proclaim and the teacher explains. The teacher breaks it apart to help you understand, to help it penetrate, to help the seed gain root to bring about understanding. The teacher yielded to the Holy Spirit imparts explanation, imparts revelation of the truths proclaimed by the preacher. But the two ministries work hand in hand. The miraculous is a demonstration of the message preached. The miraculous is a demonstration of the message taught. Jesus taught and the power flowed. The people were healed. You will see this over and over in his ministry. So Jesus, so we look at the story in its entirety. The disciples had returned to Jesus from ministering, told him all they had taught and all they had done. They taught what they had been taught, what they'd heard Jesus teaching. They saw the same results. And it's interesting because there are spiritual laws governing the word of God. If you go back to the 1940s and 1950s, you'll see that there was a big healing revival in America. There were actually ministers that were recorded as seeing mighty miracles, signs, and wonders who were not even saved. They were using the anointing because 
it was such a free-flowing atmosphere at that time to gain financial gain. M these ministers, if you read their accounts, you will find all of them died prematurely because they played with the things of God. So I'm not advocating that. But I'm using this as an example, an illustration, friend, because what you will find if you go back and look at their ministries is the miraculous followed. What were they preaching? They were preaching the messages of men like A. A. Allen or Or Roberts. They were preaching the messages they saw that were getting the results because those messages were the Word of God. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, the, that gospel will be confirmed. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is taught, it will be confirmed with signs following. If we are teaching the message, we will see the demonstration. Because the demonstration is a demonstration of what was proclaimed or what was explained, what was taught or preached. You cannot have demonstration, therefore, without explanation. So that's what Paul was saying. The message is the power. The power is the message. It is the Spirit and the Word working together. Jesus, in John chapter 1, we see, was the Word made flesh. Jesus was the Word made flesh. Jesus was the Word made flesh. He is the message that we proclaim, that we explain, that we teach and we preach as we go forth. So they heard Jesus teach. They were healed. And then it goes on to say that when it was evening, in verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place. The time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give you give you them to eat. And they said unto him, We have but five loaves and two fishes. So this is very interesting here, and I think very important to our discussion. Romans 8 talks about the fact that to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is to be focused on the realm of the five physical senses. The disciples saw this crowd that had been there receiving ministry all day. They realized these people had been there. They'd come from the cities. They did not bring any food. They just came out seeking Jesus, seeking the power. They were chasing the miracles. Jesus taught. They received the teaching. The teaching was confirmed and the people were healed. It had been a very long day. But just like any crowd, if you're not providing them means to be physically fed, people start getting anxious, start getting, you know, cranky, for lack of a better word. People were hungry and the disciples were recognizing this. They were also recognizing the fact that there was a lot more people out there than there was with Jesus. So they came to Jesus and said, we need to send these people away so they can get something to eat before they start getting cranky. And Jesus said, we don't need to send them away. You feed them. Can you imagine what was going through the disciples at that point, friend? Uh, Jesus, didn't you hear what we said? There's like a lot of people out here. They're hungry. They're desiring food. And we don't have anything. So what do you have? What did, what, notice what it says. They said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them to me. So Jesus told them, you give them to eat. One thing you'll find with the word of God is when you receive a word from God, it is an empowerment. It is enablement. When the Holy Spirit gives you instruction, he enables you. When Jesus said, you give them to eat, he, in his words, were the very power needed to give them to eat. But in order for them to feed the people, they had to take what they had and give it to Jesus. All they had was five loaves and two fishes. They could have tried to do something with those. You know, that's all they had left. There was no other food that they had present. 
But in order to feed the multitude, in order to obey the word of God, they had to give everything they had to Jesus. One thing you'll find, friend, is the offering is a key to walking the miraculous, especially in the area of finances. People get really upset when you talk about it, you know, and there's ministers who take advantage of it. But you will find that where your money goes, your heart goes. If you hoard it up to yourself, your heart is not in the kingdom of God. When you sow into ministries such as MB Media Ministries, and you're willing to invest in the kingdom of God, your heart follows that, opening it up for the miraculous. They took everything they had. They only had, you know, the five loaves and two fishes. That's all they had. They didn't have anything else. So they took everything they had and gave it to Jesus. And notice what Jesus did here. It said, He commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. He looked up to heaven. He blessed, break, and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. So I want you to think about the timeline here, what we're talking about. The people have been here all day. Jesus had them sit down in groups of 100. Jesus told the disciples, bring me whatever you have. They brought all they had. They brought the five loaves, the two fishes to him. He blessed them, but he had commanded them to feed the multitude, not himself. Most people, when we look at this account, we read this account, we talk about Jesus feeding the multitude. But did Jesus feed the multitude? Notice what it says. He blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Who did the feeding? The disciples fed the multitude. They gave to Jesus. Jesus blessed their offering and returned it to them with an enablement. As they passed out the what they received from Jesus, it multiplied and was able to satisfy the entire crowd. Think about that. I mean, when you think about the number of people we're talking about here, if you add in women and children into this multitude, we're talking about thousands of people. The You know, the numbers, probably 5,000 men in some accounts, it tells us, which means we're probably talking 10,000 or more people. If you figure out the math, you're probably talking around 800 people per disciple. They have, so each disciple has a group of approximately, well, just, I'm just guessing here, 800 people that are sitting there, had been there all day, had been receiving ministry all day. They were hungry. They had traveled by foot to get ahead of Jesus. They'd had a very long day. They were hungry. They were, you know, in need of physical sustenance. The disciples went to Jesus. Jesus said, give me what you have. So they found the five loaves and two fishes. They gave it to Jesus. Jesus blessed it and handed it back to them. He divided those five loaves and two fishes among the 12 disciples and told them to feed the multitude, which comes out to about 800 people per disciple. I do not believe the multiplication occurred in Jesus' hands. I believe it occurred as the disciples, by faith, began to hand out the food. As they began to distribute, the multiplication occurred. It required them to take action on the, the instruction Jesus had given them. What was that instruction? You feed the multitude. But in order for them to feed the multitude, they first had to give an offering. What did they give? They gave everything they had, which was the five loaves and two fishes. When you give to God, God will take what you give to him and he will bless it and return it to you with an enablement of multiplication. Jesus returned the five loaves and two fishes with an enablement of multiplication, and the disciples then were able to hand it out and feed the entire multitude with just that one small bit. The problem is we look at the size of our offering and think it's not enough, so we hoard it to ourselves. God will never receive this. But Jesus took the small little bit that they gave and that they offered up to him. 
He blessed it. He enabled it, returned it to them, and they were able to feed the multitude. Can you see that? It required action on their part. It required faith. And you say, well, Brother Mark, I don't see anything here saying faith. They had to have confidence and trust in what Jesus had told them to have the backbone to stand before a group of 800 or so people and start hand breaking apart the little bit they had because Jesus said, you feed the multitude. They had taken times, they had traveled with Jesus. They had seen Jesus work miracles and they were trusting Jesus. So they took that little bit that Jesus had returned to them after blessing it and began to pass it out. And as they passed it out, it multiplied and the crowd was fed and satisfied. Wow, isn't that amazing? You see, walking the miraculous will require something on your part. It will require you to make an offering to God of what you have. He will bless that, return it to you. And in, in the return, you will find ability to feed the multitudes around you. But it all begins with obedience to the leading, guiding of the Spirit. Well, friend, our time is up today. Thank you for joining me. Carolyn, I love you. We pray for you. And we're believing for the very best. As we close out, let me once again remind you, you can live your life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.